So thank you very much, Jenny, for that great introduction. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. It's great to come together as we approach Latino Heritage Month and we celebrate the contributions Latinos have been making to Iowa for well over a hundred years. And it's fitting to take time to look back at this history and think about the Mexicans who migrated to the upper Midwest and specifically Iowa in the early part of the 20th century. So what I'm going to do today is highlight some of the stories preserved in the papers of Iowa Latinas in the Iowa Women's Archives. Their stories reside in photographs um, like the one, uh, actually like the one you see here. Um, and they also are preserved in memoirs and other historical documents in the Iowa Women's Archives. Uh, the stories that these documents tell matter greatly because they have the power to reframe our understanding of history and shape new interpretations about the past. So as we move through these slides, you'll notice the appearance of this beautiful monarch butterfly. It's a powerful symbol of migration as a natural occurrence that's central to the human experience through time and space. This particular monarch butterfly is the work of a fantastic artist, Fabiana Rodriguez, who generously gave us permission to use this image and the title Migration is Beautiful for our Migration is Beautiful website. And I want to acknowledge Fabiana for her generosity and vision and thank her for sharing her work with us. I also want to acknowledge a former Iowa Women's Archive student assistant, Zayetsi Luna Garcia, who worked in the Iowa Women's Archives in her freshman year, and she graduated this year. Um, and when she was with us, she created the PowerPoint template that I'm using um, today. And I, I think it's just so beautiful. It takes all of the elements from the websites and puts them together in this, in this lovely, um, brightly colored format. What we'll do today is move chronologically through the 20th century, um, situating Iowa Latino history within three major themes. Uh, the first one is early migration from Mexico into the Midwest, the 1900s to the 1930s. The second one is World War II. And finally, the period of activism that followed, which encompasses struggles for the rights of migrant workers in Iowa. Uh, this is roughly the 1950s to the 1970s. But first, I want to give you a little background on the Iowa Women's Archives. The IWA was founded in 1992 with a mission to preserve the history of Iowa women from all walks of life. The longstanding dream for the archives did not become a reality until 1990 when two prominent Iowa women Louise Noun and Mary Louise Smith presented the idea to then UI President Hunter Rawlings. And Rawlings responded by saying he would provide space for the archives, but what would they do to fund it? Um, and Louise Noun had been a longtime collector of art by women. And when she returned to her Des Moines home, she decided uh, the best way to raise that money would be to auction a particular painting that was hanging on the wall in her dining room. And that painting was Frida Kahlo's self-portrait with loose hair. When Noun auctioned this painting at Christie's in New York, it netted $1.5 million, which enabled the archives to open its doors in 1992. And at the archives 10th anniversary symposium, former UI administrator Rusty Barcelo urged the IWA to start a project to preserve the history of Iowa Latinas. And the Mujeres Latinas project got underway in 2005. Between 2005 and 2007, over a hundred oral history interviews were recorded with Iowa Latinas in different parts of the state. And here you see some of the women who conducted those interviews, Rachel Garza Carrion in Fort Madison, Teresa Garcia in Mason City, Herjina Buendia Cruz recorded interviews mostly in Spanish in the Williamsburg area. And I did most of my work in the Quad Cities area. 
16 years ago, when we started the Mujeres Latinas project, we really didn't know what we were going to find. Uh, what we did find, of course, was that Iowa had a rich and long Mexican-American history. And we focused on this earlier part of the history because it was the part that was the most in danger of being lost. Very few written records were brought in at first, um, but later individuals began donating materials like newspaper clippings, photographs, scrapbooks, postcards, and letters and memoirs. And over time, more and more material has come in and this process is ongoing. So I wanna go back to that photograph that I showed you of the seven sisters um, in the very first slide. Here it is again. And this photograph is of the seven Vallejo sisters as they pronounce their name today. And they're sitting in the backyard of their West Des Moines home. This photograph was taken in 1945, and the woman who donated it is Florence Vallejo, who's the, the third from the left, right there. And um, she was actually born in Horton, Kansas, to Mexican immigrant parents who came to the upper Midwest in 1910 and settled in Iowa in the 1940s. The family papers that she donated to us include many wonderful photographs, newspaper clippings, and her mother's memoir, originally written in Spanish and later translated into English by Florence for the benefit of her younger siblings who did not speak Spanish. Um, here are a few of the, do the documents that are preserved in um, this, the papers of this Des Moines family. In the center, you see the cover page of the memoir, La Obra de Una Mama, The Labor of a Mother, written by Florence Vallejo's mother, Martina Morado. We know about Martina Morado because she wrote her story and because her daughter, Florence Tyrannis, generously donated her papers to the Iowa Women's Archives. In the photograph on the left, you see Martina Morado and her mother shortly after they arrived in Horton, Kansas. Martina's mother was a skilled seamstress, as you can tell by the clothes that they're wearing. In Horton, she, Martina's mother took in laundry and cooked meals for workers who worked as section workers on the railroad. And this enabled her to provide for herself and her daughter. More than 40 years later, Martina would write her life story. Um, in it, she told of her marriage to Julio Vallejo and the birth of their 11 children. In the photograph taken on the right, which was taken about 100 years later, you see three generations of this family's Iowa descendants standing beneath a five foot banner of, of Martina Morado. This photograph was taken at the opening of an exhibit at the UI library called Pathways to Iowa, Migration Stories from the Iowa Women's Archives. Florence Tyrannis stands between her daughter, Patty Rankin, and her granddaughter, Nicole Rankin, who at that time in 2012 was a freshman here at the University of Iowa. So Martina's memoir is more than just a personal narrative. It is representative of thousands of Mexican women who came north from Mexico in the 1910s and made the Midwest their permanent home. It is emblematic of trails blazed by these women and provides insight into their courage and resilience as is true of immigrants today, the cultural traditions these women brought with them from their homeland enrich the communities where they settled in the US. On the eve, and this is a piece from the exhibit, the 2012 exhibit, Pathways to Iowa, which actually became the basis for the migration is a beautiful website. So on the eve of the Mexican revolution, Martina Morado and her mother left their home in central Mexico in the state of Guanajuato down here and made the long journey north to the large railroad town of Horton, Kansas. So it's a long way. Um, there many Mexicans worked as section workers for the Rock Island Railroad. And this is how Martina described it in her memoir. She wrote, soon after we left Mexico, the war of 1911 started. We arrived in the United States in April the 11th, 1910. I was 13 years old. We settled in Kansas, a place that mother didn't like much. 
We lived with mother's relatives and she worked to support me and my brother. We ran a rooming house and did laundry for people. As time passed, we got used to living in this place that we found so cold. This map from the exhibit shows Martina and her mother's departure from Guanajuato in 1910, their settlement in Horton, Kansas, where they stayed uh, and where she met Julio, who was a pipe fitter on the railroad. They raised 11 children there, and um, you see four of them in that photograph there. Um, and they traveled to, in, in the 1930s during the depression, Julio lost his job with the railroad and they were forced to go north to work in the sugar beet fields of Northern Iowa and Minnesota. And then finally in the 1940s, they settled in Des Moines. And there you see um, the photograph of, the full photograph of the seven Bellagio sisters in the backyard of their Des Moines home. And this photograph was taken in 1945. And once again, um, Julio Bellagio was able to work um, as a pipe fitter with the Rock Island Railroad. So through studying oral histories and primary sources brought together through the Mujeres Latinas project, we start to see a clearer picture of Iowa history, a history in which Latinos are key players and contributors. Primary documents like the letters, diaries, photographs, and oral histories illuminate our knowledge and understanding of the past and make this history come alive. Today, the materials gathered through the Mujeres Latinas project are among our most frequently used collections. And we are grateful to the many Latino families and organizations that have generously donated their documents and stories to the Iowa Women's Archives. Since the start of the Mujeres Latinas project in 2005, we have formed a strong partnership with LULAC in Iowa. While we were working on the Migration is Beautiful website, National LULAC president visited the IWA. And there you see him standing beside the sign uh, uh, for the M Muscatine Migrant Committee. It hangs just inside the door of our reading room. And we worked closely with Iowa LULAC to design and develop the website, which we launched in 2016 at the National LULAC Convention um, in Washington, DC. LULAC members, on the right are standing in front of the Migration is Beautiful pop-up exhibit um, in 2016. And this exhibit is currently or soon will be on display in the Des Moines Public Library. And today I announced the creation of a new Migration is Beautiful exhibit. This time it has Spanish captions, um, which will soon also be on display in the Des Moines Public Library. And I want to thank Pilar Marseille, who I believe is here this evening, for translating the captions. And I also want to thank LULAC Council 10 for funding the purchase of this exhibit. And of course, special thanks to the Des Moines Public Library for setting all of this in motion. So here is the homepage of the Migration is Beautiful website. And it was made possible, of course, by many, many people. We had numerous student assistants who worked on the website, um, to name a few, Katie Gandhi, Mariana Ramirez, and Catherine Babikian. Of course, our community partners in Iowa LULAC and the many, many librarians in the UI Preservation Department and Digital Scholarship and Publishing Studio all made this possible. In addition, we have benefited from contributions of students taught by Professor Pilar Marseille in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, who for many years have translated portions of the website into Spanish every semester as part of their collective coursework. And the work that they do is uploaded to the website. So I just wanna take a look at how you navigate it. It's fairly simple. There are three main sections. Um, a map that was de developed by librarian Rob Shepard um, and a section on people. So you could go to people and look for Martina Murado and read about her and look at the primary documents associated with her story. Or you could click on topics. And at the moment, there are four main topics, early migration, barrios and neighborhoods, the impact of World War II, and LULAC in Iowa, which basically is um, a history of the civil rights movement 
in Iowa in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So let's just take a closer look at Mexican migration to the US um, by looking at this map of the US that shows the density of Mexican population in the United States. And this is taken from the census of 1920. Um, on this map, a circle represents one to 50 people and a dot uh, represents 50 to 100 people. And of course, you see what you would expect, which is the density of population in the Southwest of the United States. But you might be surprised to see how, how many um, Mexicans are in Iowa, comparatively large numbers compared to the entire country in 1920. And so if we, if we look at Iowa through the portal of this um, interactive migration map that's on the website, um, this is this is what we see. So, on the on the migration map, there's a time clock with a time slider, and if you click on the clock, it will take you um, from the period of 1850 to 1940. Uh, this map pulls census data from federal and Iowa state population census between 1850 and 1940. The criteria for it was based on any person born in any Latin American country who came to Iowa during that period. So as I said before, the time slater shows a change over time between 1850 and 1940, and the pink dots represent Iowa towns. Um, so at first you see tiny dots and as the numbers grow, you see this definite uptick between 1910 and 1920. Um, and then if we go in deeper, we can narrow our focus. Um, let's just look at Des Moines and we can, if you click on the, the pink dot that represents um, Des Moines, and in this case, West Des Moines and Des Moines separately, then you see See that it pulls up a little piece of the actual census document. So you, you see here the individual living in, De, in West Des Moines in uh, 1920 is Marie Vasquez. She was born in 1884 in Mexico. She's living in West Des Moines. She has a husband and, and one child listed here. And up at the top here, you see that she is number 148 of 228 Mexican residents living in West Des Moines in 1920. And on the right, similarly, you see it pulls a piece of the census up um, to show you that Concepcion Bruno is um, the 87th of 247 Mexican individuals born in Mexico um, who were living in Des Moines in 1920. So what were the reasons that, um, that Mexicans were coming to Iowa in larger numbers during this period? Well, obviously what was happening in Mexico in the period from 1910 to 1917 was the Mexican revolution. And so many Mexicans left harsh economic conditions um, that often were caused by the consolidation of small farms in the hands of the wealthy under the dictator Porfirio Diaz. And many oral histories that we have tell of lives disrupt disrupted by the Mexican Revolution. Um, and many Mexicans also responded to labor shortages caused when the U.S. entered World War I. Um, and, um, and many, many companies experienced uh, a labor shortage. And in addition to this, um, of course, uh, during World War I, the, um, during World War I, there was a federal restriction on European immigration, which further um, had a, created a shortage of labor. So between 1900 and 1930, we see a sharp increase in the number of Mexicans living in Iowa from roughly around 30 to about 3,000. And that would, of course, be a very conservative estimate because if you think about it, a lot of census, census takers would have missed many Mexicans who lived um, perhaps uh, on the outskirts of towns or, or they were traveling as, as um, migrant workers. So, 
But despite the low numbers, nonetheless, from 30 to around 3,000, we're looking at at least a 100% growth in Iowa's Mexican population. So what exactly did the industrial landscape of Iowa look like during this period? What were the job opportunities? Well, as early as 1900, they came to work on the railroads. And of course, this is a photograph from the Santa Fe uh, of Santa Fe Railroad workers in Port Madison, but the Rock Island Railroad ran across the state. And you see those, those numbers of Mexicans living in Iowa, they, they very much follow the railroad line. Another primary occupation um, that drew Mexicans to Iowa was the agricultural labor and especially the sugar beet industry in the north of the state where the American Crystal Sugar Company had um, a facility in Mason City. And many also came to work in foundries. In Bettendorf, for example, the Bettendorf Car Company, which manufactured railroad car frames for the undercarriages of railroad cars. Um, they sent representatives to the border to recruit Mexicans to come to, uh, to Bettendorf to work in its foundries. And the people that they brought um, lived in a community that was known as Holy City. And this is um, a slide of, of a box railroad boxcar home in Holy City. Um, and standing in front of it are the Rodriguez children, who were the children of Norberto Rodriguez, who you see um, his immigration card here on the, on the left. Um, Norber Norberto Rodriguez was born in Mexico in 1892 and came to the US in 1910. For a time, he lived in the coal mining town of Buxton in South Central Iowa. And then migrated with his family to Bettendorf in the 1920s, where he worked as a chipper in the foundry of the Bettendorf Car Company. The Rodriguez family lived in Holy City and these two box cars um, were joined together by Norberto. And um, the child on the right is Estefania Rodriguez who donated these photographs to the archives and they're preserved in her papers in the Iowa Women's Archives. The 1930 census recorded, um, and on the right you see this piece of the census, and with it recorded Norberto Rodriguez as living in Bettendorf. It shows he was born in Mexico in 1891 and lived in Bettendorf, and this was the 1930 census. He was living with his wife, Maggie Rodriguez, and his immigration records are preserved as part of the extensive papers of his son, Ernest Rodriguez, who was a founding member of the Davenport Lulac Council 10 in the 1950s and a prominent civil rights activist throughout his adult life. The Bettendorf Company prospered until the, the Great Depression when it permanently closed its doors. And by the 1940s, many of the children born to this first generation of Mexican immigrants in Iowa were 18 years and older, and they joined and were drafted into the military um, for World War II in large numbers. In fact, they were the largest non-white group to serve in the military during World War II. So this is part of the papers of a prominent Des Moines woman, Isla Rodriguez Plasencia and her parents were from central Mexico. Her father came as a young boy during the Mexican revolution. And Isla supported the war effort in the 1940s by gathering scrap metal with other Mexican American women in Des Moines. And there you see that photograph. Um, Isla Plasencia, I think is, is the second from the right there. Um, in an oral history interview recorded by Rachel Carrion, Isla recalled that World War II, in her words, wiped out her family. Her sister died from a ruptured appendix and her two brothers died in the Pacific War. Um, on the right, the Western Union telegram sent to Isla Rodriguez in West Des Moines informed her of her brother, Second Lieutenant Bernardo Navala's death in a Japanese POW camp on February the 2nd, 1945. World War II was a turning point 
for many Latinos as it was for African Americans in Iowa who no longer accepted the inequities they had experienced when they were young. They formed and joined civil rights organizations to advocate for their rights. And Isla Plasencia was instrumental in forming uh, LULAC councils in Des Moines. The family of another Des Moines woman, Mary Dominguez Campos, came to the US from central Mexico in the 1910s. She was born in Oklahoma in 1929, where her father worked in the coal mines. But after an explosion in the mine killed her godfather, the family began working as migrant ag agricultural laborers in the sugar beet fields of Northern Iowa and Southern Minnesota. And later the Dominguez family settled permanently in Des Moines where her father worked as a truck driver. And when he could no longer work due to an injury, her mother sewed Oshkosh overalls at a local factory while Mary and her sisters attended school in Des Moines. Mary graduated from St. Joseph's Academy in Des Moines and became a secretary. In the 1950s, she went to work in the office of Stanley Griffin, a medical doctor from North Carolina. As Mary remembered in an oral history interview conducted by Rachel Garza Carrion, we were the first multicultural doctor's office. He was black and I was brown and we serviced everybody, pink, yellow, blue, whatever color. We had the first bilingual medical practice that I know of here in Des Moines. Um, Stanley Griffin was the husband of the now famous and then infamous civil rights activist, Edna Griffin. It surely was no coincidence that Mary Campos went on to dedicate her life to advocating for social justice through gender and racial equality. Both Isla Plasencia and Mary Campos have been inducted into the Iowa Latino Hall of Fame. And I just wanna talk about one more um, Des Moines um, rabble rouser, Sister Irene Munoz. She was born and raised in West Des Moines. Her father worked for the Portland Cement Company where he was active in the union. And her mother was a devout Catholic. In fact, three of her daughters became, went, became nuns. On the left is a photograph of the original Muscatine Migrant Committee sign that you saw before um, that is preserved in the IWA along with the records of the Mus Muscatine Migrant Committee. Sister Irene trained as a public health nurse and she entered the Congregation of the Humility of Mary in Davenport and then came to work and live in Muscatine in 1967. And um, she was very inspired by Vatican II and she wanted to go out into the community and work for change. And for her, this meant working at, to advocate for the needs of migrant workers. And in the Muscatine area, um, I did not mention this before, but among the agricultural industries of Iowa, um, Heinz Corporation had a major canning facility in Muscatine and um, the tomato growers, the farmers around contracted with Heinz to grow tomatoes and the people who came to cultivate tomatoes in Muscatine were largely from Texas as this, as this sign shows. They were Mexican Americans from Texas. So um, Sister Irene ran health clinics in in Muscatine, she helped with daycare and she visited migrant camps and she was horrified by the poor conditions that many migrants lived in in these camps. By the late 60s, the three sisters, because her two older sisters were also nuns and they had developed a reputation as quote, um, troubleshooters on the front lines in the farming area around Muscatine. And in her interview, um, Sister Irene, recalled that when they first came to Muscatine, the farmers called them the good nuns, but after a while uh, they called them, they referred to them as those damn nuns. Sister Irene understood that the root of migrant poverty in Iowa and elsewhere was embedded in the exclusion of agricultural workers from the New Deal provisions that had benefited most workers. And what this meant was that as in other parts of the country, migrant workers in Iowa were not covered by the collective bargaining provisions of the National Labor Relations Act, which meant that they didn't have the right to organize a union. And nor were they covered by the minimum wage overtime and child labor provisions of the Fair Labor Standards Act. 
um, which meant that migrant children of any age could be could work on Iowa farms. Um, and so there was a big push in the 1960s to pass an Iowa migrant child labor law. In 1967, Mexican Americans and their allies supported this bill and it was very contentious as it was pushed through the state legislature. Support for the bill came from church groups, unions, LULAC, migrant agencies, and as well as settled out migrant workers who lived permanently in Mason City and Muscatine. And I would note that um, on the, in this photograph, which was taken um, with Governor Harold Hughes in the center after the signing of this migrant child labor law, um, on the, on the right are um, Irene and Jose Guzman, who were very involved in the Migrant Action Program and staunch advocates for this legislation. And they are also another Des Moines, um, settled permanently in Des Moines. But um, when the bill passed, although it was a major accomplishment to get it through, when, the, when it passed, it was very weak. It prohibited farmers from, and I quote, knowingly employing migrant children under the age, and can you believe it, under the age of 10 on farms in, in Muscatine. So two years later, when um, the state legislature convened again, um, there was an effort to come back and strengthen that law. And on the left here, you see this flyer, it's known as the Easter leaflet that was in the papers of Lulac Council 10, found in the old attic part of, of the building. Um, the Easter leaflet urges Iowans to support two bills pending in the state legislature. The first would strengthen that child labor bill law, and the second would regulate housing by establishing a minimum standard for migrant housing on Iowa farms. And on the right, what you see is a, something called the, a CEO news article. And in this case, CEO does not stand for chief executive officer. It rather stands for community effort organization. And this was a, um, this was uh, an organization, a grassroots organization made up of former mig migrant workers who were now living permanently in Muscatine. And on the bottom there, you can say it says, let us leave the chickens to the chicken shack, chicken shacks and the pigs to the pig pens. And we better move into better housing and let's join with the great boycott of grapes with Cesar Chavez and support them and at the same time support ourselves and work together to help every migrant worker of the United States. So here we see this sort of movement propelled in Iowa by support, um, the momentum from the boycott of California table grapes that was led by Cesar Chavez is then gaining steam. And in Iowa, migrant workers and activists are, are taking that momentum and harnessing it to their own issues to see that it is not okay that these standards are as bad as they are in Iowa. And in um, the spring of 1969, on March the 19th, um, there was a big march in Des Moines in support of migrant workers and to push this legislation through. And it really was a sort of collective coming together of trade unions and activists and um, Latino organizations, LULAC, you can see the signs of LULAC and also UAW. Um, they, I believe that the labor movement in Des Moines, the Iowa Federation of Labor, they, they actually chartered buses to bring people to come and, and protest outside the state house. And uh, 1,500 demonstrators gathered and the director of the UAW Region 4 called for a union organizing drive of migrant workers in Iowa. State legislators responded to this pressure and in May 1969, the migrant camp bill passed effective immediately. And then later, an, a new Iowa child labor law got rid of the word knowingly and made it illegal to hire children under the age of 12 in migrant in migratory labor without a work permit issued by an Iowa labor commissioner under order of a juvenile court judge. 
So after months of heated debate, that was signed into law. And I just finally want to say that, yes, Cesar Chavez, of course, came to Iowa in 1969. He came here because he recognized the strength of Iowa support for his movement and his cause, the rights of grape pickers in Delano, California. So um, I'm going to finish there. And I, I just want to close with this slide. This is a government publication published in 1970, and it says, Adonde vamos ahora? Where are we going now? And it's a report of the problems of the Spanish surname, the migrant population in Iowa, prepared by the Iowa State Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. And I think that question is a great place for us to end and to think about because it's as relevant a question today as it was back in 1970. Um, a couple ideas. Um, I'm excited about having the Spanish language exhibit on display at the, uh, at the Des Moines Public Library. And we're, I'm also working with my colleagues um, who I believe are here um, on developing um, K-12 teacher resources and lesson plans. And th these are some of the places that we're going with the Migration is Beautiful project. So I hope that um, you will share your thoughts and ideas um, here um, and who I hope will join in the conversation is Pilar Marseille um, and Julia Oliver Rajan and our LULAC project assistant, Shamila Transtenvot, who's working very hard on developing lesson plans to incorporate um, Latino history into third grade um, lessons. So, um, and of course, we also have with us here today, Mike Reyes from, um, from Iowa LULAC, former state director of Iowa LULAC. So I'm gonna finish there and open it up for any questions and discussion. Janet, thank you so much and for I your presentation. I guess I'm gonna stop sh sharing my screen. I can, there it is, okay. Uh, and participants, I think you will now find you are able to unmute yourself uh, and or start your video if you have questions, um, comments, things you'd like to talk about um, or share. Uh, Janet, thank you again for your presentation. It was absolutely wonderful. And we will be sharing that contact information as well as a survey for you to take in an email that will follow uh, this program by a few days. Uh, so everyone watch your email inboxes uh, for that contact information if you didn't get a chance to uh, scribble it down or um, again, uh, for that survey, which helps us uh, with our programming planning. So does anybody have any questions uh, for Janet or her colleagues? I was wondering, Janet, if I could get you to talk a little bit more about some of those resources you're working on for um, in the classroom for the, the K to 12. Um, what sort of things are you working on? Well, our contact has been with the Davenport Community School District and we're working with their curriculum writers um, at the moment. And the suggestion, we're trying to sort of meet them where they're at because we don't exactly know what their needs are. And they've suggested that we focus on third grade because the for social studies, the focus for third grade is migration, immigration. So that fits very well with the material we have here. Um, so we just have a very, very modest goal um, um, of developing three lesson plans that they will um, approve and they're, we're sort of working back and forth and, and this isn't this is done in collaboration with LULAC Council 10. I serve on the education committee of LULAC Council 10 and um, Joe Morales is also on the education committee as well as Mike Reyes and so we're the ones who've been meeting with the Davenport Community School District to try to sort of move this forward. So what we're hoping is we'll have three lesson plans and by the end of the year and that at least one of them will be in Spanish. So it could also serve a purpose as of being um, a, a, a resource for English language learners. Wonderful, thank you.
I have a question for Janet. Hi, Joe. Uh, I'm down here at Simpson College. So my question to you is we're going to be talking about labor, Latino community, and labor in general here in Iowa. But do you plan, does uh, your university plan on doing a second or third segment bringing uh, the history of Latino community up to the present? And can that also be encouraged at other universities in Iowa? Well, the short answer is we don't have a definitive plan, but it must be done because what we have captured here is the first chapter of this story. And um, like I said at the beginning, we focused on the early period because it was the most in danger of being lost, but um, we need to pick it up and bring it forward. And we do have a, a handful of interviews um, that, that relate to the later period. And specifically, I think we would be focusing on the story of packing house workers in Iowa because that's such a, an important part of Iowa history. Um, and, and in that, I, I have uh, worked with uh, John McCurley and the Iowa Labor History Oral Project. And, and we've kind of collaborated and um, he, uh, so we, we have one interview with a woman from Postville that was conducted in Spanish and um, she was arrested during the ice raid in 2008. Um, so, so we have just a tiny amount of more recent material. And I really think that we need to have a major push and it probably is time um, to, to do that. Um, whether that would mean a grant proposal, uh, it, it definitely requires dedicated staff to go out and, um, and do the work. Um, it also requires some collaboration with other parts of the state because, you know, different areas are doing different work and we don't want to um, be sort of in, at, at UNI, I know they did a lot of work um, on Postville. Uh, so they have a lot of resources up there. So we want to be sure that we're just mindful that, that we're collaborating rather than repeating um, work. Thank you, Janet. You're welcome. Are there Can any I ask? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, well, I, just... I wanted to ask a question. If there's anybody here from the Des Moines Public Library who wants to talk about what ideas they might have for programming in the fall, um, because certainly this is just a starting point um, of materials that we have, but the idea of working with community and gathering more stories or whatever having more prog programs, having Spanish language programs. Um, I'd like to hear what, what you're thinking about for the next few months. Absolutely. Um, well, I did drop into the chat in case anyone hasn't seen it yet. Um, the link to our community page, which has a whole bunch of different information on amazing programming that should be happening throughout Latino Heritage Month. Um, we do have uh, some spark stories that'll be coming up with some local uh, Latinx community leaders. Uh, one just went out this past Wednesday, so yesterday, uh, with Zuli Garcia talking about uh, Knock and Drop Iowa um, and how the Latino community really helped us navigate the COVID-19 um, pandemic and, and food insecurity that, that arose during that time. Um, of course, we've got the Migration is Beautiful exhibit that is coming. I believe it goes up on Sunday. And on that same day, um, there is another exhibit that will be opening up at the Central Library um, from Miriam, uh, who is the artist behind the Little Luchadors uh, exhibit. So that will be there, um, as well as a, an, enter an entertaining family program with all sorts of different activities. Um, there's all sorts of other programs happening at the various branches. So if you haven't had a chance yet, do click on the link. Uh, but of course, we are always open and excited to hear about ideas from the community about what sort of uh, what sort of programming you'd like to see, who it is that we don't know about yet to partner with, that we should be partnering with. Um, always the goal is to, to amplify the voices and, and show the work that's already being done. So um, 
I will also drop my email in the chat. I'm Jenny, I'm at the Northside Library. So please do let me know if there are things that I should know uh, or programs that we should be doing. We're always excited to hear from people. I don't know if Ash or um, Rebecca have anything to add, also librarians. Did anyone else have any sort of other uh, other questions they might have or things they'd like to share that's that are going on um, in the community? Rebecca says there are a few other things in the works, so stay tuned. Um, certainly new things come out all the time. So. I wonder, Pilar, can you talk a little about how your students have worked with the project and the ways in which that has been beneficial to them? You're muted. Okay, well, I teach here at the University of Fireways uh, an introductory course of translating, translation English into Spanish. So when I started teaching this back in the Middle East, a long time ago, I contacted with uh, Janet and they showed me this Iowa Women Archives before they even have the website. And we started translation, we started translating the, the vignettes, uh, you know, the, these biographical bits that they have. I chose this project for two main reasons. First, because it was, it was a first person account and you know, for for language linguistic reasons and for the type of text and everything, it's it's excellent for practicing translation, and it, it it's tricky. It's more tricky than it looks like. So my students really get very engaged into it. Second is because it's an opportunity for my students to have a real client. Actually, they do the work themselves. I only edit it. They do it in class, and then we send it to Janet, and Janet is kind enough to post it on the website. And third, because also they are, they learn about the archives and they learn about the lives of these women. So what is interesting now is the website has also the, you know, recorded bits of these women talking about their lives and what, you know, what happened to them. And also stories, you know, that sometimes are really heartbreaking or, or even things that they find out and they, they had no idea. People, you know, students who are from Iowa and even from the Quad Cities and from other areas that, you know, they say, oh, really, that, that neighborhood existed there. And they really learn a lot and they really enjoy the project a lot. So uh, for them is a, for them is really a very good experience. So far it's been, you know, one of the highlights of the course is collaborating with the Iowa Women Archives and, and the Migration in Beautiful website and, and do the job, so. Uh, but we'll keep doing it. <laughs> as long as they are, there's something to translate, we'll be there trying to, to help. But yeah, that's, uh, that's really what, what we do and we hope to keep doing for a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, friends, we are creeping up on that seven o'clock hour and I do wanna make sure we get out in a timely fashion. Um, I will make just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, once again, thank you so much to uh, Janet for coming and speaking with us today uh, and to the Iowa Women's Archives for sharing the Migration is Beautiful project with us. On Sunday, starting Sunday and going uh, for quite some time, you'll be able to see that exhibit in person at the Central Library. I believe it's also traveling to the East Library, but if you click on that link on uh, Des, Moines, Des Moines Public Library's community resources, you'll be able to get the exact dates uh, for both of those. Um, also to check out that, those Spark Stories and some of the other events that we have coming up. Um, you'll find in the, uh, in the chat also our contact information, um, and I will be sending out an email to everyone who participated or signed up, um, an email with the contact information slide that was shared earlier today, um, some more information on those community resources. Um, 
and also a survey that we ask that everyone take uh, just the two minutes it takes to fill out really quickly. It gives us a chance to evaluate our programming, how they're going, um, and also what other sorts of programming might be beneficial for everyone. So please do take a chance to fill that out. You will probably get it at the early next week rather than tomorrow, uh, but please do keep your eye out for it. Um, thank you again so much everyone for coming out tonight um, and particularly to our presenter. Any last minute thoughts? Excellent, well, thank you so much again, everyone. We'll have more programming real soon. <laughs>